We're very glad you're here. Thank you very much, Seth, for coming. I, I'd like to welcome you all here this morning to uh, this, I think, very important event. And again, another in the evolution of the tech community here in Western New York and Buffalo particularly. I'm going to just uh, do a little commercial for, for a minute if I can first, and then we'll, uh, we'll, talk, we'll get into a conversation with uh, Seth. First, I, I'd like to, everybody knows Dan Manjusevsky. Where's Dan? I had him here. I went and got him. Well, Dan, very Dan is Dan is Can busy. We turn this way down. Thank you. Dan is busy uh, getting uh, making sure everybody's here. But Dan is uh, in charge of Z80 Labs. We're um, there. He is. Hi, Dan. And uh, Dan has done a really wonderful job of uh, bringing companies into the uh, laboratory, into the into Z80, and uh, helping us to grow this uh, this this opportunity. You know, when 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 Ronnie and I decided to do this um, uh, about two years ago. Uh, you know, Ron, Ron thought I was insane. He said, it, you know, really gonna be difficult to have anything successful in Buffalo. There's just not a lot of entrepreneurs and there's not a lot of people willing to take risks and, you know, it's, it'll be an abject failure and it, it's gonna cost us a lot of money. And I said, you could be right. You know, and Mark reinforced what Ronnie said, is Mark is responsible for the money. Um, but but uh, I said we're doing it anyways because it was really, you know, I, I, I'm a, one of these people that, you know, has an opinion about everything. But I also believe that if you're going to, come on, there's some seats in the front. Come down. Come on down, as Bob Barker would say, but nobody here knows who Bob Barker is. We want you to sit up front. Hello again. So, so. She was on my flight. Oh, she was on your flight. Yes. Oh, great. <laughs> So we, we, you know, I said, we're going to do it anyways, because I'm drawing a line in the sand. You know, I'm not going to let any longer the Seth Godins and the, the Chris Sakas of the world leave Buffalo and not have an opportunity to think they could stay here and actually create something unique, special, and, and, and world-changing. And, and so we're going to try, and we'll give it a shot. And if it works, it'll be great. And if it doesn't work, we can at least say that we did our part to try to make something happen here in Western New York. So that was the whole evolution of Z80. And, and I would say that, you know, we're a little about a year and a half into it. We have seven companies in the incubator, two more that we've accepted. Uh, we have a few more that are trying to get in, but um, they need to get a few things together before they can, you know, leave their jobs to do it. So we're, we're having some, some, some progress. We have two companies that have raised a um, million dollars, you know, and uh, have, a, have a team and a staff. And so we're seeing the, the, the fruits of some of the, of the benefit of the results. I think that as you all, you've come down here and see what's going on downtown, you know, it's created a level of excitement in Buffalo that we haven't had in a long time. Um, and uh, we're, we're really, we're, we're, we're all feeling there's an energy, there's something positive happening. You saw in the paper yesterday that Buffalo is the highest appreciating real estate of any city in the United States. Uh, that's the first time that's ever been something that we can think of, at least certainly not in a long time. You know, 100 years ago today, as I assume everyone knows, this was the eighth largest city in the United States. 100 years ago. Uh, uh, but so, so you know, there, there's, there's a good feeling, there's positive energy. Um, I think uh, everyone know Andrew. Andrew, uh, Andrew has uh, just come to Buffalo. Um, Andrew came here from Minneapolis. And Andrew is, uh, is in charge of the... Uh, Buffalo Business Plan Competition. I'm careful about the name because we're sort of figuring out the name right now, but it will be the largest business plan competition in the United States ever. We will be giving away a prize. We were giving away $5 million on October 30th of uh, next year. Uh, first prize will be $1 million. There'll be a half a dozen prizes of a half a million dollars. We are taking it internationally. We're going to go across the United States and announce the, pro the, pro the program. And then we're going to London and Tel Aviv and Mumbai and Delhi and, and Beijing and a bunch of other cities around the world and say, move to Buffalo. If you win the competition, you move to Buffalo. We'll give you a lot of money. We'll give you all the nurturing. We'll give you all the assistance. We'll give you a place to do, start your business and come to Buffalo. And hopefully, as a result of what a lot of you are, are here today and what a lot of you are trying to do will be infectious and they'll come here and they'll stay here and we'll grow more companies. You know, um, I don't think Ashok is here today, but as you all know, we had another great exit, you know, uh, uh, liaison, $219 million exit for a company started here. Nichols 
kid went to grew up in Buffalo, left, came back, started his business here, and yet another exit. Of course, we've had you know a series of them over the last couple of years. And and the reason I say it is that you don't have to go to New York or to Silicon Valley or to Boston or to Austin or any of the other places that we think about in order to start a business. We've had in the last couple of years, uh, Campus Labs, uh, Cinecore going public, Liaison, and, and a few others that have had exits that have been pretty significant for people. And you know, obviously, it's not you know a list as long as we see in other places, but the point is it can be done, and uh, it and I think we'll find more of those. So I applaud all of you for staying here, for creating businesses here, for doing things here. We will continue to do what we can to help in every way possible. One of those things is pigeonholing in the airport. Uh, Seth, as he comes to visit his father, who's one of the, I'm sorry his father's not here. If you saw his father, they look like twins. Um, his father is one of the really special, special people in this community. He's done so much, and I think that's one of the reasons that Seth has been successful and, and is, is also does the things he does. You know, um, Bill and, and his mother, his mother ran for, for decades. The, the, the gift shop at the Albright Knox Art Gallery. That was, her, that was her thing. She basically started it, she ran it, she lived there every day as a volunteer. You know, and, and, uh, and then his father chaired at one point the United Way campaign here. He's chaired so many things in the Jewish community and elsewhere and, and left such a great legacy for, for his family. And I think it's one of the reasons Seth does come back because he knows he's got deep roots here. Um, you're all here because of Seth Godin, so I'm not gonna talk anymore. I was going to give you a whole, whole bio on him, but I think you're all here because you know who he is. He really is one of the most successful and influential people in technology. Has been for a long time. He's done wonderful, wonderful things. Um, he, he's written, I think it's eight books now? Is Seventeen. It? Seventeen. I've only read eight. <laughs> Seventeen. Seventeen books. I haven't read 17 books, so I can't. So, um, but he's, he's, so he's written 17 books. He's lectures around the world. He's, He's one of the more sought after speakers for anybody that wants to talk about what's going on, particularly in the social, in the social web today. And he gets paid for it, for us, because he's from Williamsville, because Buffalo matters, because he cares about what we're trying to do and he'd like to see it grow. Um, as soon as I asked him, he said, tell me when you want me. I said, next time you come to visit your dad, just let me know and we'll carve out a few hours. He said, how's this date? Great. I'll be there. We'll make sure we get a bunch of people there, and um, and and you know he's here today to talk to all of us. So Seth, I really appreciate you being here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. I need three volunteers to come up front. Go go go! One, two, three. Come. There's plenty of room. Super. Thanks. All right. So I'm going to ask Seth a few questions that I've always wanted to ask him. Um, and then I'm going to leave it open to the audience for you guys to ask questions or start to talk about what he wants. Um, you know, and this is obviously something that, you know, you have to ask because it's what it is. But, you know, you grew up in Buffalo, you started in Buffalo, you went to school here. Um, what, what about Buffalo's helped you in your career, if anything? Um, well, the, the first, before I answer the questions, part of the answer is it's people like you. And I think you need to take uh, an enormous amount of credit for the influence you've had on the people in this room and in this town. Um, but I've lived in a lot of places, and that sense of uh, civic, it's not even obligation, it's civic contribution is one of the things that I learned in Buffalo. It has a huge impact. So thank you for all of that. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, li I grew up walking distance from the Clearfield Public Library, read every science fiction book in the whole uh, section, uh, paid 25 cents to skate at the rink two or three times a week. Uh, and the combination of that small town, big town thing, that you could see a Frank Lloyd Wright house and walk to skating and pay a quarter, uh, the spending so much time with, with the contemporary art at the Albright Knox. You know, when I go uh, to MoMA in New York, people end up following me around wherever, if I'm with somebody, because they want to hear me talk about the paintings. I'm just making it all up, but <laughs> they like hearing it. It must be a Buffalo thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so that, I think one of the things, you know, Buffalo has an unfair self-image problem, which we could solve in two minutes if we just all stopped apologizing for being from Buffalo. But one of the things that comes with that is this ability to question things. 
it's not a sort of a jingoistic patriotism. It's why is it that way? How do we make something better? How do we contribute to take something up a notch? And it's precisely the opposite of Silicon Valley, right? That you know, it, Silicon Valley can't accurately be called completely arrogant because they do some stuff there. It's not like they're just pretending. But on the other hand, you're not able to talk about or improve or contribute to the systems because the systems are perfect and no one's allowed to talk about it. And Buffalo is coming along and saying, look, we have this great heritage, we have this great history, but mostly we have these people. And people here are willing to question stuff. Let's figure out what works and do more of that. And I share that feeling every day. I'm, I'm going to go and uh, get back a little bit of history as well. So I apologize, but you know, um, Yo-Yo Dine was a company most of you probably don't know about, but it's the company that Seth started, and I think from the perspective of a lot of things, Scott, your career really launched in, in many ways. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about it because a lot of what we're trying to do is startups, right? Sure. So you had to, you started a company, you raised money, and uh, he's, you know, he is Fred Wilson, who I think some of you got to meet when Fred Fred's came, first investment. Fred came to Buffalo to actually open Z80 Labs and spent a day here, and he's been back once uh, since, and he's uh, actually agreed to be a judge at the business plan competition. Um, but he, um, you, you raised money, you grew the business, you sold the business, you had to go and be part of a big company, you had to move to California, you didn't last all that long, you came back. I think it would be very important for everyone here who's so many of the people from this community are trying to think about startups. Sure. Talk, if you could talk a little bit about, I know Yo-Yo Dine was a long time ago. We were young then. I was an investor through Fred. But um, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you started it, the idea, the fundraising, and the exit. Okay. Um, I, the first most important thing is I needed to make a decision, and I failed to make a decision, so I almost had a nervous breakdown. And the decision was freelancer or entrepreneur. And freelancers get paid when they work. Freelancers are basically people who have themselves as a boss. The freelancer is the cheapest, smartest person available to hire when you're the boss. It's you, right? And so I'd been a freelancer for a long time as an author, as a book packager, as somebody who had been playing with one project after another. And uh, when I started Yo-Yo Dine, before it, there was a World Wide Web, this was uh, 1990 was our first project. And I had a, a bunch of ideas that ended up informing a lot of the way the web works today, but we were really early. And at the beginning, I was a freelancer. I went to Prodigy, I sold them an idea, I built it, I hired some people to do the skills I didn't have, and then we did it for AOL, and we did it for CompuServe, and it was a thing. Uh, the internet started to heat up, and I had the opportunity and the need uh, to raise money. And the second you raise money, what you've decided to do is sell your business. Because the only people who are going to invest venture money and you are investing in it you, so that you will sell the business and give the money back. And that mindset isn't obvious. It's not said out loud a lot, but it's true. And the other thing that you need to do the second you raise money is stop hiring yourself. Because you might be the cheapest person, but that's not your job. Your job isn't to do the work. Your job is to figure out what needs to be done next. And so there was a crisis for me because I was still running my book business. On one side of the hall, I had 11 people who were making a book a month as a book packager. And on this side of the hall, I had 50 people, of which 37 reported directly to me. And if it was a big sale, I was going to go. And if it was a project uh, decision, I was going to be in on it. And I was just a freelancer running uh, without amphetamines, but probably could have used some. And then I realized that I was failing because I was foolishly hiring myself to do all this work. And as soon as I shifted gears and realized that there are a lot of people smarter than me, even though they're more expensive than me, everything changed. And in one day, we hired 17 salespeople. Uh, we had a, pro uh, a, a whole bunch of processes in place that could actually scale. And this whole time I'm doing this, I'm dancing with the fact that we're going to run out of money. Because in 1995, the way that uh, you worked on the web is you got big. You didn't have to get profitable, you got big. And there was a crisis with my board, because some people on my board said, you have to get big. And some people on my board said, you can't run a business that doesn't make a profit. So Yoyo Dine was busy competing with companies like Riddler and Yahoo that were content to burn money all day long. 
you know, Riddler had raised $80 million, we had raised five. And so I was determined to grow and be profitable, which meant that we were going on sales calls to the American Expresses and the Procter & Gamble's of the world, and I was trying to sell them something for a million dollars, and my competitors were selling them something for zero. And we were still making sales, because we were significantly more disciplined than they were about what we were trying to build and what we were delivering. So I could talk for about 400 hours about all of these lessons, but the, the, the basic uh, arc of the story was that uh, one day in September of 1998, we hit profitability, which meant that we were on track to scale for as long as we could keep our, our model scaling. And uh, at the same time, I was out raising more money. Uh, the reason that I was raising more money is that there's a difference. When you're a freelancer, if you're making $1,000 a day, you're done, right? That's plenty. If you're an entrepreneur and you're making $1,000 a day, that has to be the beginning because the people who backed you didn't back you so you would have a good job as a freelancer. Um, so I was out raising money, and one of the companies uh, I was trying to raise money from offered to buy us instead. And that led to a whole conflagration of things that happened very, very fast. Uh, and I did the math, and at some point, this is money, right? And I did the math and I said, if I don't take this offer to sell my company today, it will take me three more years of growing the way we're growing to get back to where I would be today. And there's a lot of risk in all those cards being dealt for the next three years. And it turned out I was right, the bubble burst a year and a half later, so we never would have made it three years out. And um, so when I hear about the Snapchat guys, turning down $3 billion, I say, you know, if, if you want to change the world, don't take venture capital. If you want to change the world, you need to uh, own the path that you're on. But the minute you took that investment, you are saying to someone who's an investor who's not in it for the same reason you are, I will make you more money tomorrow. Um, and so, you know, I wanted my team to find a good place to land. I wanted to take the ideas that we had worked so hard and cried and lost sleep over and bring them to a, a larger audience. So every single time you guys get a piece of email uh, that you signed up for, that's because of the work we did. Um, and I'm proud of that, because it's way better than you guys getting spam. Um, and I still hear from the team, and we changed a lot of people for the better. Um, but it was exhausting, and it took me a couple years to recover. It's hard. Yeah, it's very it's hard. Really hard. I, I hard but worth it. Everyone I, should do it once. I've done it twice. <laughs> Um, and it was hard the second time. But talk for a second, if you will, then. Let's take the next step. You sold to a, you know, he sold to Yahoo and moved to Silicon Valley. Um, and uh, talk for a, a minute about what it's like. It's one of those things that I deal with a lot of our entrepreneurs. I don't want to be part of this big company. I'm not going to be in a corporate. I, won't, I don't want to sell. I remember when we, we were busy trying to sell, uh, uh, a draw something, uh, OMG Pop, to, uh, to, to Zynga. And Dan Porter, I can't work for him. I can't work for them. And I kept saying to him, it's $209 million, right? You know, I mean, you can work for anybody for that, you know? <laughs> and, uh, I, and, 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 and he's sort of, a, sort of uh, you know Dan, I think, maybe, I don't know if you know yeah, Dan, but Dan's know. a liberal, uh, beyond a liberal, right? You know, and it's not about the money, although he's since bought a $6 million house in Brooklyn, so I guess it was. But anyways, <laughs> he, I had a fight with him to accept the, uh, to, to really do this deal, right? Sure. Bijan Sabat and I, like, spent hours, like, take it, take it. Talk a little bit about, because if these guys, when they have their exits, you know, uh, Eric is here and Eric sold to Hire One, which is, a, which is a big company and getting absorbed, but they stayed in Buffalo. Talk, yep. talk a little bit about the lessons that you learned that... Okay, well, you know, for, I'm gonna presume here, but I think for all of us, it's personal. Uh, the promises you make to your employees are personal. The business you say you're gonna run is personal. The reactions and interactions you have with your customers are personal. Uh, once a company is public, it's not personal anymore. And the people who work in that company eventually, no matter how good their intent is, don't act like it's personal. Because for too many times, their boss's boss's boss changed the rules. And for too many times, they realized you can't make a personal promise face to face with someone when you have a boss's boss's boss and keep it, because that person didn't make the promise, you did. And so large organizations shift in the way that they think about stuff. Uh, they're not necessarily evil, but they are bureaucracies that create value through the actions that they take. The other thing to keep in mind is that uh, public stock is a currency, and it's a currency that's based on belief. 
at some level. P-E ratio is nothing but a number, but that number can change. So Jack Welch played with the public currency of General Electric, and even though he was running a bank, he got it valued like he was in the manufacturing business. And for 25 years, a lot of people were very happy with what Jack Welch did. When you sell a company to a public company, they're going to print up some stock and hand it to you. That dilutes the shareholders. So if they give you 1% of their company, and then, and I didn't get 1% of Yahoo, and my investors didn't get 1% of Yahoo, but if they give you 1% of Yahoo, and on the announcement that they did that, Yahoo stock goes up 2%, it means your company was free. It means it didn't cost them anything to buy your company. <laughs> and that's a really important thing to understand. Because what's going on in the tech sector is the shuffling of a lot of assets in the service, not just of how you serve customers, but in the service of what story you tell investors. And so if the story that's being told to investors is that the company is on the march, that it's growing, that it's going in the right direction, and investors applaud that, the stock's going to go up more than it costs them uh, to buy your company. So all of a sudden, it stops being personal again. Well, I got to Yahoo, and um, I've never, I don't really talk about it in public because it wasn't done to entertain the public. Uh, but I got there, and it was a big shift for someone who had been running as fast as I had been running for as long as I had been doing it. We were near bankruptcy for eight years, and suddenly I was in a company that was never going to go bankrupt. Um, and what I learned, you know, within six weeks is there is a platform here that you will never get to touch on your own, right? That the ability to move ideas and the ability to leverage things in a large public company is huge. And the question is, are you mature enough and disciplined enough to take advantage of that, or do you have to act the way you used to act? And for me, I was able to shift gears and, and, and bring some leverage to what was going on there. You know, one of the products that we invented uh, that didn't come out, and I'll tell you why later if you want, but we don't have it infinite time, uh, is Yahoo had billions of unsold web banners. They always do. And um, so I said, well, can I have a billion of them and I'll run a test. And we invented Yahoo Coffee. And the idea of Yahoo Coffee is you'd see a banner for Yahoo Coffee and you'd click on it. And uh, we'd give you a coffee maker or some Scharfenberger chocolate and in exchange you'd subscribe to a pound of delicious Yahoo Coffee uh, high in caffeine delivered to your door uh, once a month. And you can do the math. It's just math, right? And we did the test, and we proved it was a $100 million a year business. Um, and it would scale, right? We ended up not launching it because if Yahoo got seen as a, product, a company that sold products as, a company that, as opposed to a company that was in the internet connection business, their valuation would shift because product companies weren't worth as much. So they turned to me and they said, well, yeah, this is great, and it would make $100 million, but it would make our stock go down instead of making our stock go up. And we're in the business of pleasing our investors. So not right now. And the old me would have stamped his foot and run off because I was right. But of course, I wasn't right because there was something else going on here. And that's the big lesson of being in the corporate environment. Some people are great at that. And some people aren't. And um, I left for reasons that had nothing to do with Yahoo. They were all related to personal stuff. Um, but it was an interesting environment to be in. Uh, particularly in 1999, which was the mm -hmm. Renaissance. Um, and everyone should try it once after they build their company once, and then you can figure out what you want to do after that. T t that's, that, that's great. Let, let me just a show of hands. How many people here work for a startup? Hands down. How many people would like to work in a startup that don't? What, what is that, timid? Come on, let, I want to see the hand up. All right. You know, I have a slide, and I give a speech that I do in New York, and one of the slides says, uh, I think I'm thinking of doing a startup. That means you're not, by right. the way. Exactly. That means you're not. I have people I went to business school with 30 years ago yeah. still say that. It's like my, I said to my wife, heard me say something the other day, a, you know, a hope is not a plan, and it isn't, right? It's not a plan. I mean, if you're thinking about doing it, just do it. You're either jumping in or you're not jumping in. Let, let, let's talk about the land of the startup which okay. is Silicon Valley. You live there. Tell us about the, if anybody gets the opportunity and they get recruited or pitched to come to Silicon right. Valley or they get to buy, tell us about what the, your lessons that you learn and what, you, what, what advice you can give about Silicon Valley. Well, the two best things, for sure, are the weather. And I love cross-country skiing. I'm going to do it tomorrow when I get home, right? But the, this is something different about 
always being able to have the top down on your Miata, just always. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but the second thing is everyone knows what you do. Like here, you, the number of explanations you have to give to your mother-in-law is infinite. They will never <laughs> figure out what you do, right. right? And even in New York where I live, you know, you're surrounded by lawyers. You're not surrounded by people who get the journey. And in the Valley, they, everyone gets that. Now that's a plus because it saves a lot of time and you're more likely to bump into people who will up your game. It's a significant negative because the group think is overwhelming, right? That the, in the book business, I like to say that every bestseller is a surprise bestseller. That if you go down the list of bestsellers, none of them are the ones that everyone said were going to work. Well, the same thing's true in startups. That the startups that change everybody's mind and the startups that are worth a billion dollars are always a surprise. There's never the one, colors.com, that, that would have been a non-surprise success because everyone said, put a bunch of money and it's going to work. The problem with the Valley is you're surrounded by the status quo thinking of people who are defending their point of view because they're already successful. And so when you're surrounded by all these people who got successful doing a thing, they don't want to hear that a different thing is the right thing. And so you have to insulate yourself from that. And one of the, you know, I'm, I've been a maverick since I was 14 and when I started my first company here in Buffalo. And um, mavericks like it when there are people around them who are open to hearing how their world is going to be changed. Right? And it's harder to be a maverick in the valley. It's easier to be a maverick here. And I think you should embrace that as opposed to waiting for all the Buffalo Bills fans on your block to say you have a good idea before you start. Advice. Um, 17 books, now that I know. Um, <laughs> if I was only going to, if the young entrepreneur was only going to read one of them to start, tell us which one it would be and why. Right, how many kids do you have? Two. So if I said if I could only meet one of them, which kid? I, I actually know the answer, but with my, <laughs> my wife is here. She'd be mad at me, but she'd give you the same answer. <laughs> <laughs> that, all right, I don't even want to go there. Uh, all right, I'll, I have two. I'll let you pick two. No, right. seriously, if you were, right. so, not, your, not the best. I'm saying if, right. for entrepreneurs. Yeah. So uh, I wrote one that's free, so you can just try that one. Just Google Bootstrapper's Bible, um, and it's about running a company with no money, so you don't have to work with people like him. <laughs> uh, I think that the lessons in the Bootstrapper's Bible are really helpful for people who aren't necessarily given access to a, a lot of funding. And most businesses, and you would agree, don't, it's not appropriate for someone like you to fund 99% of the businesses in the world, right? That that kind of funding just doesn't get you the, the, the X. Uh, in terms of where I see entrepreneurs uh, in this space screwing up, the biggest uh, opportunity is in my book, All Marketers Are Liars. And that book is not about the tactics at all of entrepreneurship, it's about storytelling. It's about the fact that you will be judged or you will be ignored and that human beings are not computers. Uh, the simplest example, uh, Association of Wine Economists did a study a couple years ago and they have proven that expensive wine tastes better than inexpensive wine even if you switch the fluids in the two bottles. <laughs> and this is among people who are professional wine tasting people. Um, that human beings are, are, are not perfected machines. We uh, come to conclusions based on what we see and what we interact with, and the way you tell your story matters an enormous amount. And I think getting that part right is critical to spreading your idea. I have more questions, but I'll, I'll see. Anybody have a question in the audience? No, I'm Jim Brandt. Hi, Jim. Um, so the question on using uh, technology companies to get you um, I'm curious. Sure. Your team sort of, you kind of sold your team yep. in a way to your company. You know, how long do you expect that they're going to stay around? And what are the expectations for your company? You know, like, will you not be successful? Sure. So let's talk about business to business selling first. How many of you sell the businesses as opposed to consumers? Uh, great. Business to business selling is the same as selling to consumers, except that the person who's spending money, it's not their money. And so the question is, what analysis are they making when they decide to buy something? And the answer is, when I tell my boss this story, will she be happy I did this? 
That's the driver of all business to business development. Will this make my boss happy? What story will I be able to tell her about what I just did? So for years and years, IBM was a good thing to buy if you were an IT professional because no one ever got fired for buying IBM. It doesn't matter if you saved $1,000. I wanted one that I, right? So when they buy a company, the same thing is going on, right? The, the CEO has to answer to Wall Street or the biz dev person has to answer to the CEO. And the question is, what story do I tell? Because we can all agree that when you acquire a company with no revenue, there's no rational measure and there's no multiple that you can use, right? You can't say, well, it's three cents per lines of line of code or $18 per registered user because what's this registered user versus that registered user? And I knew this going in because I came from the book business. And the way the book business works is every author, me, Stephen King, and someone you never heard of, all of us get the same royalties. So the only way that they tell us apart is by how much advance you get up front. So you send a 20-page proposal to the publishers, and sometimes the publisher sends back no. Sometimes they send you back $5,000, and sometimes other people get a check for like $5 million for the same 20 sheets of paper. What are they buying, right? They're buying hope. They're buying a story. They're buying the ability to say to the sales force and the shareholders and the booksellers, this is the next big thing. Well, the same thing's going on when they're buying a company. What's the appropriate price for Snapchat? Well, the answer today is $1 more than Microsoft is willing to pay, or $1 more than Facebook is willing to pay. That's the price. And that's the story you tell your boss. Good news, I snatched Snapchat away. And so that, the reason we all heard the Snapchat story is someone leaked it. Why did they leak it? They leaked it so that other people would hear that they turned down three, so that someone would come up and offer them 3.1, right? And everything else you hear is just rationalization. It's just complete rationalization. Because people don't like to say, I just tell stories that don't make any sense. They say, no, 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 we've done it by this, and we've done the math, and we've done this. And they make charts and graphs so they can show their boss, this one makes sense. You know, I, I sold my company to Yahoo for a rounding error. And then nine weeks later, Mark Cuban sold Broadcast.com. My company was profitable. His wasn't. My company's ideas still worked. His, you know. Yes, the internet has video on it, but broadcast.com as a model didn't make any sense, right? For $3 billion. Why was his company worth thousands of times more than mine? And the answer is because it was public. And since his company was public, the Wall Street had already decided what it was worth. You couldn't argue with what they had decided. That's just what they decided. So buying it, you had to pay more than that. That's the price, right? So the challenge when you are selling a company is, no one wants to buy a company you're trying to sell, because if you're trying to sell it, it must be worth less than you're trying to sell it for, or why would you try to sell it? And everyone wants to buy a company other people are trying to buy. And when those two things are true, you're not trying to sell it, and multiple people are trying to buy it, that's how the price gets set. Right? So that, that's, there's the rational subset of real acquisitions theory, which is that there's synergies, and that they'll be able to plug this in, and this thing will happen, and blah, blah, blah. But that's just, in, in the valley, that just supports the story. So now we get back to how long do they expect the team to stay and blah, 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 blah. And it completely varies, right? That Cisco did this beautifully for 20 years. For 20 years, what Cisco did was their R&D department was the world. And if you came up with a good idea and you could prove it worked, they would buy you a Cisco stock. The stock would go up more than they paid you, so it was free. You and your team would stay because your options kept accruing. And they didn't want you to leave because no one in the company knew how to do what you were doing except you, right? Whereas when they bought Instagram, I think they would have been fine if all the Instagram guys had left because they didn't need them. There's enough programmers at Facebook who could look at the code base and say, stop arguing with us. We know what to do now. It wasn't the same model as the Cisco model. So it all varies, right? The challenge as the entrepreneur is this. Hopefully, the people you have hired didn't sign up so that three years from now you can sell it for a lot of money and they'll be rich. Because that's a, such a long shot that you don't want people motivated by it. They fell in love with you and what you do and the organization you built and why you're doing it, what it is to be around you. So then all of a sudden, mom and dad come home from work one day and they say, kids, we sold the family, right? <laughs> and we're going to go move to Brooklyn, but you have to go stay over here. Don't worry. The new mom and dad are really cool people. <laughs> and it's horrible, right? 
but it's, it's not a family, right? At some point, you've all signed up to do some sort of commerce, and this is the big challenge. Um, and there is no easy shortcut here, other than, at least in my experience, telling people the truth every single day. And that's what we did in our organization. Um, and it was still hard, Real, the hardest thing I've ever done at work, by far. Um, so I don't have a shortcut for, you, for that one. But thank you for the good question. To add, to add something to the question, it was an example. We sold a company called Hyperpublic to Groupon. And um, the CEO was a business guy, and everybody else were technology guys. So they said to the CEO, you can leave. And everyone else, had to, we had to lock their op, their, all their equity up for four years. They had to move to either Chicago or Silicon Valley from New York, and they were locked up for four years. Um, and we, as, and, they, and then to the cap table, which I think you understand, the employees get a piece, the investors get a piece. In today, today's world, the investors, they try to screw the investors every time because nobody cares. They want the people. They want the, the talent. They want the technology. So a lot of the money didn't go to the cap table. It went to the employees, and it went as retention for them to stay. So they like, gave their price a much different price than we got. But the only thing that ours was contingent upon was delivering the entire team. We had to deliver, uh, I think there was uh, 12 engineers. We had to deliver 10 of the 12 engineers for us to get our check. And if we didn't deliver them, then we didn't get paid either. So, I mean, the team in this case was now, it, it turns out half the people didn't last. And they gave up their stock to come back and do another startup as the same team. It's called Wildcard. It's kind of interesting. But, but you know, that, that's it, all this stuff happens. You know, I, I, I've done this twice because I, I run Squidoo now. I'm not running it with other people's money. But um, in, this, in the option agreements, it says on the day of a change of control, you get all your stock. Because I wouldn't do that deal. Unless they all agreed before I did the deal, I wouldn't do that deal. I just, I, I'm here for the long haul, and I don't want people to think that I forced them to do something where they get nothing. But that's just me. Yes, sir. Uh, my name's Alex. Um, I would say the most easily transferred habit is I blog every day. I don't understand why everyone doesn't blog every day. I think that if you blog every day, you will become more honest with yourself and you will think more clearly about what you do and why you do it, even if no one reads your blog. Just knowing that every day you have to write something about what you're doing and what you've learned, I find it, it just forces me uh, to pay attention. So that's the, the easiest one. Uh, in terms of uh, a, a one that goes a little bit deeper, I would say uh, it was teaching myself uh, not to panic. That, you know, we are at the pinnacle, pointy, pointy top of the privileged world pyramid of being able to move bits around to entertain business people or, or consumers and somehow get paid more money than most people will earn in five lifetimes, right? We don't grow wheat. We're not in an emergency room. We're not sitting here, you know, in the slums of Kibera trying to string things together. And so when you're sitting there saying, oh my God, oh my God, there's a presentation tomorrow, it's just much easier to say, I'm going to play. And this is the show, right? And it, it'll all work out. And if this doesn't work out, the next thing will work out. That habit took me a long time because I was so close to wiping out. And in my head, wiping out meant dying. It didn't mean getting you know, a job I wouldn't like for a little while before I got to do it again. But I made it too dramatic. Well, we're going to have a little fun with you in a sec. I just oh, want to yeah. recognize you know, Ron Frankel just came. Ron is the CEO of Cinecore, where, where he's employing 350 people here in Buffalo. And uh, George isn't here, but you know, when Ron got here about 13 years ago now, we had you know, a couple dozen people in. Um, so now we're, 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 we're one of those things where we're hiring and growing a company here, and um, uh, I'm glad that he came today. We're going to get to you in a minute, but I'm going to have a little fun with Seth just for a second. Um, and that is, uh, you know, I'm going to give you a list of companies. I'm going to read your company's name. Uh, just give us a one sentence on what you think, uh, what your thoughts on this company. Whatever thought comes I, to I mind. I might not play, but go ahead and try. Whatever thought. <laughs> Vine. I don't know enough. Pinterest? Uh, they pre-stole that idea from me. 
<laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> Year, years ago, I would, I, my very first real job, I, had a, I worked at a uh, software company. I did a line of science fiction stuff. Ray Bradbury, uh, Michael Crichton, uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke. It was a dream come true for me. And Harry Harrison, who wrote Soylent Green and uh, Star, um, Stainless Steel Rat, he was my next one up. And we went out for drinks one night. And he said, ah, oh, that Michael Crichton, I don't speak to him anymore. And I said, well, why? And he said, because I wrote an entire novel. And I was two weeks away from sending it in. And then he published The Andromeda Strain. He pre-stole my idea. <laughs> and like, Michael didn't even know Harry Harrison existed. And the same thing's true for me in Pinterest. Squidoo was this close to being Pinterest. Mm. I will say this about Pinterest. And you know, we're involved in BuzzFeed. And we just, uh, I think, we'll, we, I don't know if we've announced it. We, we crossed last month, we just crossed over 130 million uniques. And for the first time in the history of the company, Pinterest is the second most important source of, of traffic after Facebook. Didn't even, know, nowhere close before. Google was searched. Pinterest is now number two. Yeah. And we're seeing that in many companies. Yeah. So if you're not following or playing, play, paying attention to Pinterest, yeah. brilliant, pay, brilliant mechanics. pay attention. YouTube. Uh, um, well, a bunch of people like me 15 years ago said that this is what happens when you, you know, uh, disintermediate. People who are intermediators have trouble now because we don't need a gatekeeper. And YouTube is the best proof ever of the long tail. Um, so for people in the outside world, you don't need somebody's permission to give a keynote speech, post an hour-long infomercial, train people. It's, there's this thing, and it's free, and it works, right? And it's being way underutilized. I think it's the beginning for YouTube, not the end. Facebook? Um, you know, Facebook is also a brilliant mechanics story. And I think Cheryl has her hands full figuring out how to scale the monetization. Here's the choice. Either your customers are your product or your customers are your customers. And in the case of Facebook, they're the product, meaning that Facebook collects all this attention and then sells it to advertisers. That's tension, right? Twitter has it worse. So there's tension there. The more money Facebook makes, the more they annoy their users. And the future has to get to the point where the user is happy when you make money, not that the user is tolerating you when you make money. Because otherwise, it ends up being like NPR on Pledge Week, right? Which is, how many more things can we put on before you turn the station? That's Cheryl's challenge going forward. You mentioned Twitter. Um, yeah. The, my idea with Twitter that I posted about a year ago was, I don't understand why Twitter didn't say to its million power users, you pay us $10 a month, and this is going to be the best platform ever for you. Because that would be enough to build a company for the ages, where they could do things just for their power users, and then they could grow that number, right? And they'd be fine. But as soon as they signed on for the tension of, we're going to interrupt why you're using this with something you don't want to see, it becomes this really significant conflict if you want to try to build. You know, the magic of CBS and NBC was not only did they change the culture every night, but they set a number of minutes that they would interrupt us, and we tolerated it. And it was a fair trade. You got Seinfeld, but you got six minutes of commercials. OK, we're even. But the only way you can scale that is by charging more per commercial. The web doesn't reward that thinking because it's always a race to the bottom. And so since media is always a race to the bottom, there's this constant incentive to jam more ads into every nook and cranny. And so there's lots of nook and crannies inside Twitter. But the more they do that, the less people are, are going to love it. LinkedIn? Um, well, Reed is brilliant, talking about mechanics. He really understands this. I think they're not on the cultural radar as much as they will be. Um, they're building this underlying sort of bedrock of uh, a professional graph, and I'm just not seeing it showing up on my radar yet. It's coming. AOL? Um, AOL, you know, when, when Tim took it over, Almost every penny they got in profit was from people who were paying a monthly fee for a service they forgot they had signed up for. Mm. <laughs> and uh, that's still true a little bit, but he has been really brave and bold. Um, Ariana is a genius and is reinventing uh, 
media and her ideas have been stolen with, a, with appropriate credit by people like BuzzFeed. Um, and so it's, it's still a crucible of what's going to be We would take a different point of view. She, that she was, there was Jonah's technology manager. Fine. But okay. she and we're the, they were a team, right? <laughs> I think Jonah is wicked brilliant. He knows That's that. Jonah Peretti, by the way, we're talking about. Jonah is the smartest viral marketer in the world. Uh, Google? Yeah, I don't want to go there. And, of course, we can't not ask you about Yahoo. Um, you know, I think there's an awful lot of misogyny in the world, and it's really easy to treat uh, women CEOs different than men CEOs. Um, but I think, given the hand that she was dealt, Marissa is on her way to building something way more interesting than what she got. What do you think of their Tumblr acquisition? Yeah, that was one of those magic acquisitions that entrepreneurs can hope for, but they paid a dollar more than someone else was about to pay, as far as I can tell. Questions? My name is Rory Jones. My question is, what do you think the biggest misconceptions um, I would say misconception number one is that venture capitalists give you money. Um, <laughs> And that misconception number two is that getting money is the important or hard part. Right? That sooner or later, you've, I hope you've all read Steve Blank. You should read as much Steve Blank as you can. Um, but sooner or later, you have to prove a business model. And you might get lucky and sell before you prove a business model, but it's way better to just prove a business model. And that's the hard part. How do you create something that would be missed if you were gone? How do you create something that you can scale and repeat and that's enough value that someone will actually pay for it. That because I, I hustle, Yo Yo Dine was built from the first day with, on sales. I would make a sale and then we would build something. And because of that, we always knew who our customer were, was and we always knew what they wanted. Whereas if you isolate yourself because you've raised money from someone who's not your customer, you're going to build something that may or may not be interesting to people who are actually going to pay for it. It was a huge struggle. Like, wait, you just sent that letter? Wait, stop. I know how to write that letter better, right? And I depended on myself for so long that depending on other people to do work I knew how to do better than them was really painful. And, you know, I came up, I had a, I was a beta tester for the first Mac. So from the time I was 24, it was an extension of me. So I knew how to typeset, I knew how to do spreadsheets, and I installed Snapchat, what was it called, Snap Talk, the first internal thing. I mean, I just knew how to get my hands dirty in it. And the hard part was saying, that's not my job anymore. And some days I'm pretty self-disciplined, and I just decided that I was going to become an entrepreneur instead. And it was really hard. And so now that I have the choice, I'm back to being a freelancer because it's just my nature. I like being a freelancer better. Hi there. Uh, thank you. Um, I was wondering, how do you ignite the passion of your team? Um, so Vincent's question is, how do you ignite the passion of your team? The best shortcut is to hire a team with passion. <laughs> <laughs> and um, here's why I want you to think deeply about that, because it's not a funny answer. Buffalo is an industrial city. And if you want to dig into what I'm talking about with industrialism, Lynchpin and Icarus Deception are both about this. Industrialists own the means of production, right? The Trico windshield wiper factory. You can't make windshield wipers at home. You've got to go there to make windshield wipers. And built into that is an inherent tension between the person who owns the machines and the people who work there. The person who owns the machines wants the people who work there to do exactly what they are told and to do it faster and more obediently than yesterday. And the people who work there, why they often unionize is they want power against this person who is forcing them to be a compliant cog in a senseless machine that's trying to extract too much from them. So when you grow up in a culture where that's the mindset, and someone says, I am hiring, you don't show up and say, I have passion. You show up and say, what do you want me to do? And when you say, what do you want me to do, you're asking the other person to act like an industrialist. 
And the thing about startup culture and the thing about what all of us are trying to change in the world is this. We don't know what to do tomorrow. And we don't want you to do what you did yesterday, but faster and cheaper, because tomorrow will be different than yesterday. So hiring obedient cogs is the worst possible thing you can do if you want to have a startup. So what has to happen is the whole culture has to change, because guess what? China is way better at us at creating obedient, cheap cogs. And we can't win that race. We do have a shot at winning the race of hiring artists, of creating a culture of people who figure out what to do next. So you're not going to be able to change the whole culture, but you can decide who works in your company. And so for me, the model has been, and I've only learned this recently, but it's been very effective. I never hire anybody who hasn't done a project for me for money first. And so there's lots of projects you can imagine giving people. And sometimes the project lasts a year, sometimes the project lasts a week. But here's a project, I value your work, I'm going to pay you for it. And I'm not giving you this project as an audition, I just need a project done. And over time, you know, last year I probably worked with 100, 200, 300 people who did various projects for me. Every once in a while someone shows up who's passionate and honest and ethical and an artist and a linchpin that I can't live without, and then I will do anything I can to hire that person. Because I'm not hiring based on, are you good at interviewing? Because I don't make interviews for a living. I don't need people who are good at interviewing, <laughs> right? But if you can find people who, just by their nature, bring passion to the table, you don't have to do a silly passion dance for them. You're just going to give them a platform and say, go. And as an entrepreneur, as opposed to a freelancer, part of what you have to do to keep that passion going is not micromanage them, keep your promises, and do your job which is giving them more freshly Zambodied ice to skate on as fast as they possibly can. You know, it was interesting. We were, and I'm, you're gonna, uh, it was interesting. Uh, you know, we had our, our, uh, our, our company uh, holiday dinner last week in New York. And so we have a bunch of, a lot of Japanese from SoftBank that actually work out of our New York office. And, and so we, you know, you start to have a few drinks and you start to get philosophical. So we got into this discussion about, you know, and one of the gentlemen has, had been the CFO of Mitsubishi at one time. Now he works for uh, Masa Yoshison's brother and who owns Gung Ho, and, and he's sort of the guy in the U.S. And so I said to him, Jim, you know, Jim is not his name, but he's got, they all have a name, it's Jim. So I said, Jim, you know, it was kind of interesting. What's driving the economy of Japan today when you think about the consumer electronics industry is completely, I mean, it's gone, right? It was Sony, Panasonic, they're all gone. They don't, the, and it's not even the Chinese, that have, the Koreans first that kick, kick their asses, right? And then the Chinese are coming next. And other than Toyota, the car companies, they, you know, they, remember when the, some of you that are a little older, the, the Japanese were everything made in Japan, right? They were gonna, they, they were destroying the American economy. Now their economy's in the, in the toilet because they let everybody else take theirs. And, and we were thinking about it, and then we started talking about New York City and the resilience, right? I mean, the, the garment industry, gone, but, you know, was there. The financial service, pretty much gone. And Madison Avenue, the ad, I mean, New York keeps, keeps being resilient and reinventing itself. So if you were the CMO of Buffalo, what would you give us advice to ensure that we don't have that, that we change things, that we can make something different happen here, and that we can change that so that all the things that happened here that passed us by, that we can try to move right. forward and going ahead? Um, I thought you were going to ask a different question, so I have to take away that I'm answer. sorry. Um, the first thing to do is quit, because you can't be a CMO if you don't have authority. And we need to acknowledge, and Buffalo keeps wasting a lot of cycles with someone pretending they have some website or some committee that's going to change, but you can't. That's not the way it works, right? It's an amorphous collection of stories. It's not someone in charge who gets to say, this is the logo and no one's allowed to use something else or you're fired. And CMOs don't do logos, I'm just giving you an example. Um, the right answer is amplify the great stories. And you figure out how to create legends around things and around people because those legends are the things that start changing the way people talk and people think. So, you know, I don't know how many times I've had to explain to people, it doesn't snow that much in Buffalo. But there's legendary snowstorms, and the legend is something we can get our, our arms around. So what are the myths that we want to tell people when we talk about Buffalo? So this Buffalo business plan example is a great example, right? You don't need to 
an authority to say you're allowed to do this. You don't need permission to do this. You're just doing it. And as you do it and as it starts to spread, that story gets added to another story, gets added to another story. Right? The number of people who say, I'm alive today because I went to Roswell, that's a story. That's a legendary story that can spread. So this, this is not a top-down solution here. It's a bottom-up solution. The people in this room are going to make the stories. And then the goal is to figure out how do you daily candy-like find the good stories and amplify them. That's good advice. We're going to do one more question. I just want to let, you know, I want to, because when we answer, we have... Dickie's Donuts outside. That they, Paula's, I'm sorry, Paula's Donuts. I mean Paula's Donuts. You, you can't eat a whole one, because otherwise they're about 4,000 calories, but we have them outside. Please feel free to stick around afterwards and mingle. Seth's going to stick around a little bit, then he's going to go into Z80, he's going to meet with the companies and give them a little advice and hear about what they're doing. Last question, Coach Meatloss. So what, what is it that uh, benefits um, smart community companies to create the investigation? Like, what are they Right. Okay. So Kevin's question is, what do B2B uh, companies do to create a culture, not inside, but outside, that makes it so that when they show up, the business is ready to buy from them? Is that basically it? Uh, for me, it goes like this. Most people you're selling to in a B2B environment are insecure and lonely. Um, they are insecure because they're not exactly sure what the boss wants. And they are lonely because there are very few people who do exactly what they do, and they don't know those people. And so, you know, for a living, I, I speak. And uh, at conferences, who's coming, right? Who's coming are people who could watch people like me free on YouTube, but are spending a lot of money to come and go to another place. Why? Partly because there's some energy in the room, but often because the person sitting next to them is lonely like they are. And it's this web of connections and and authority and, and name checking and things that gives them the confidence to do their job ever better. And in certain industries, like the ad industry 10 years ago, it was really profound to watch this need and, and understanding of connections. In the VC industry, it's showing up in the last five years that VCs used to be real lone wolves, but now there's way more intermingling and talking among them. And so what your job is, is to lead this tribe is to be the beater of the drum to create connection. To you, what you want to come out of your work is the following sentence. People like us do things like this. And that is a magic sentence. If you look at the adoption of Twitter by Fortune 500 brands, it happened in like a six week period of time. Zero, 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 400 of them. Why? Well. It wasn't because Twitter did something. It was because they put enough stuff into the water supply that when a few people went out on the edge, like Frank at Comcast and, and one or two other people, all the other people who were already using Twitter for fun saw it happening, and they said, wait, people like Frank, who are the smart leaders, are doing things like this, so I need to, too. So that, you know, the, the product adoption lifecycle was really steep there. And the reason it's so steep is when it comes to things like social media, the insecurity runs so deep, everyone's alert for what people like them are doing. So it turns out that you have to over-invest, not in the ROI of your offering, and not in the reliability of your offering, which are a given. You have to over-invest in what does the tribe say about you when they talk to one another. And the easiest way to do that is to either get them to all come to one place, or you have to go to see all of them over and over and over again. Or you can use permission marketing and say, how do I get them to read something I write every week? So that over time, right? You know, in, in your case, let's assume that there's 20 other people who do what you do. Ranking those people, pointing out to the audience which of those people do which thing better, and telling the truth about what you're not the best at gives you credibility. And suddenly, everyone in the industry needs to read that white paper because otherwise they're gonna have their worst nightmare come true, which is they're gonna to go to a meeting and they're gonna say something and the other people are gonna say, didn't you read that? We're laughing at you now. That's the worst thing that they can imagine. And you can create an environment where they want to be in sync with you. And most organizations don't say what I just said out loud. And because they don't, they don't invest in it because they don't think it's important. So I guess I'll give you a, a, a last thought before we, uh, we, we, before we wrap this up. 
When I go to New Jersey and speak to pharmaceutical manufacturers, what they always say is, it's the FDA's fault. They say, we would love to do something innovative, but the FDA won't let us. And when I go and speak in Akron, Ohio, or wherever, they say, well, it's the flyover fault, and there's nobody here who's going to invest money in us. And you know, I was in uh, uh, India giving a talk two years ago. And I mean, everyone's got a perfect excuse, everyone. And in the Valley, the excuse is the opposite. Everyone here is doing everything. There's nothing left for me to do. The point is, I know what your excuse is. It's an excellent, great excuse. But it's the biggest asset you got, right? And the fact is that in the choose yourself economy that we now live in, with resources like Jordy and his team available to you, the fact that you're only an hour flight from uh, New York and seven hours from Silicon Valley is trivial. And it's a mindset choice, right? There's plenty of talent here, plenty of resources here. What you have to do is embrace this idea of flying closer to the sun, closer than your parents would have expected you to, way closer than your third grade teacher said you had any right to do. But the door is open, and it's not going to be open for much longer. But this is your moment. You're in the right place at the right time, finally. And I hope you'll go make a ruckus. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.